Today's lecture uh, will attempt to make some connections between the various materials that um, you have on the Austro-Hungarian Empire, especially since the, since the textbooks themselves uh, that you're using do not cover it as such or specifically, so this is why you have other materials that I have <coughs> posted and um, the readings, maps and so on, uh, which you should use to, to, to create. To, to accumulate the information that normally you know the, the other text would, would give you. So these are your textbook. But in this lecture I'm going to try to point out a few elements that <coughs> are worth underlining, that you should pay attention to, and uh, that should help you uh, understand that uh, that you know information collected from these sources. So uh, notice that we have started our discussion in fact because the subject of, of our discussion starts uh, which is Austro-Hungarian Empire, so that I call it that way, although that's not completely correct. So the subject itself starts in 1867. Why in 1867? Because this is when you have the famous compromise, or Ausgleich in German. Uh, and this is the, the, um, the, this arrangement between the emperor, basically, uh, and the Hungarian nation, of course represented by the nobles, right, because they were the Hungarian nation, right? Uh, by which the Austrian Empire, which was always a multinational empire led by an emperor who was in direct, you know, uh, linkage with different lands who were linked to him then, right? Uh, lands and institutions, right? Um, so this is transformed, right, into a dual uh, monarchy, a famous dual monarchy, right? Uh, and it becomes, uh, you know, this, this very unique um, uh, invention, right? This very unique and multifaceted invention, uh, trying uh, to respond to the conditions of the time. So it was a dual monarchy because from now on there will be two distinct entities. So we can call it a confederation, right? Uh, um, uh, a confederation uh, of, of individual entities, right? And one entity will be the Kingdom of Hungary, and the other one will be, well, the Austrian Empire itself, or rather, uh, what the way they called it, uh, Cisleitania. The Cisleitania and Transleitania, right? Cisleitania and Transleitania. Cisleitania was the basically the, Aust the, the, the part of the Austrian Empire and Transleitania was Hungary. They didn't really refer much to it as Transleitania, but more, more like Hungary, the Kingdom of Hungary. While, but this was referred to as Cisleitania because it was actually a conglomeration of different lands, right? And you see already one of the tensions here. Why give this specific relationship, this specific dual nature to, to just to the Hungarian Kingdom? Why not also give it to another historical kingdom, Bohemia? And from your readings, you have seen that this became a key problem, and probably you know one of the many reasons uh, why the the whole project perhaps uh, uh, was undermined was the fact that the the, the Czechs, right, the, the people, uh, the, the Slavic people of Bohemia and Moravia, were not very happy, were not very happy with with them being a third sort of ranking uh, partner. They have always been loyal to the emperor, uh, more than the Hungarians who have continuously revolted uh, against the Habsburgs, uh, and they have been all long term associated with this, uh, um, uh, you know, ruling family. Uh, but they also had a history of statehood, so so why not become you know a third partner, so have a triune uh, uh, monarchy, right? Not a dual monarchy, but a tri triune monarchy. So there was that project, and which your in the readings, you know, is described that it fails, and that's a that's a huge problem, right? So you see already uh, the complexity of the thing. But back to the structure that was set up by the compromise by the Ausgleich of 1867, creating the Austria-Hungary or the Austria-Hungarian monarchy, which is somewhat incorrect because, well, first of all, it didn't, re didn't uh, refer to itself as such, uh, and it was a monarchy only in as much as it had a monarch. But this monarch was the Emperor of Austria, Emperor of this part, and the King of Hungary, and he was crowned separately. Right? Famously, the doctrine of the Holy Crown of Saint Stephen, right, in Hungary, given to the Emperor, in this case, by the nobles, and that's them giving him the crown, which they have done, the nobility of Hungary has done in uh, centuries preceding uh, to different kings, right? this idea of a nation of nobles who gives the crown to a certain emperor, just like it used to be in Poland. Right? 
While here he was the uh, so he was the king of Hungary separately and the emperor of Austria. Furthermore, uh, what makes it that could be a personal union, right? That could be a personal union. It could be two lands united by one ruler, but that wasn't the personal union. Uh, it was it was a confederal arrangement, right? Uh, and um, uh, we will talk about this a little bit more uh, later, but just briefly, uh, states, modern states, can be organized around different. Um, ways of organization, right? In a modern state, you... Uh, a modern state, which is what? A, a set of institutions with exclusive power over territory membership. And this exclusive power can be given to one entity, one center, and that's all, you know, the only source of, uh, of, of authority in that, in that country. It can be uh, divided equally between local and central uh, uh, levels, and that's the federal system in which different uh, there are two levels of government, national and regional, and each of them has power over different aspects of your life. Or it can be conflict in which the powers are actually given to the units composing it distinctly. So each of them becomes a, an, a holder of exclusive power. But these uh, individual units then delegate some of these power or functions to a central level, right? So in this case, right, it's more of a confederal, fe between confederal and federal, because you have two entities, the uh, Austrian, Austrian Cisleitania, right, part, which has its own government that runs most aspects of the life, and hung the Kingdom of Hungary, which has its own government that runs most aspects of the life, right? And then they have a common central, very small uh, uh, level of, of rule, right? But the sovereignty is located in these individual units, right? So that's what makes it a dual monarchy. That it's made of two different countries in a way, two different, two different states, which share certain functions. And those functions uh, will be the, 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 the uh, you know, few, and, and the emperor will be part of that common function. This is why it makes a sort of a confederal uh, uh, arrangement, uh, uh, you know. The U.S. is a, is a federal arrangement, right? Uh, the, the U.S. as it is today. Before the Constitution, the U.S. was organized actually according to the Articles of Confederation, in which it was a confederacy, in which this was the model. With the Thirteen formerly colonies, now states, run, you know, govern themselves, and just delegated certain functions to a very weak central government. Certain functions that had to do with foreign affairs, military, and so on. So you see the similarity. Because these would be also the functions delegated by the two individual units to the, to the common level of, uh, of, 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 of government, but that common level is only endowed with very few things that, which have to do with common defense, common foreign affairs. That's all, basically. Some common finance. Okay. So each of these units was governed as quasi a parliamentary uh, system, as quasi a constitutional monarchy. Now, let me clarify these terms. What is a constitutional monarchy? Well, as opposite to, to absolute monarchy, a constitutional monarchy is a monarchy in which the, the, the monarch right, is bound by the constitution. Right? So that means that there is a rule of law within which the monarch has a specific role. Uh, his position is just one within the whole system, the whole political system. And all of it is under the rule of law. That's what, it, it means that the constitution puts limits on the power of the monarch. That's the model of many uh, democracies in Western Europe. The UK is a constitutional monarchy today, uh, Denmark uh, is a constitutional monarchy, Sweden, uh, uh, and, and, so, and, and Norway, and so on, Spain. Uh, and so on and so on. Okay? Um, so that's how the, uh, each of the individual component units and the whole thing was, in a way, a constitutional monarchy. Okay? Um, then I said that it was a parliamentary system, or a parliamentary democracy, parliamentary system, which meant that, what is a parliamentary system? Contrary to, for example, the American model, which is a presidential system, not because the president is the greatest uh, uh, person alive, but that's just how it's called. He's not even the most important uh, actor in the, in the system in, in many ways. But a parliamentary system is a different sort of political system. 
Um, and we will review these when we get to the uh, 1990s and the establishment of the new democracies and we analyze how each of these countries have established their new political system. So I'm going to do a review of these terms. But you have to understand what parliamentary system is. Is in a parliamentary system, most of the power resides with the parliament. And the parliament then delegates the function of, the uh, of, of, uh, of administer uh, administering the country to an executive made of ministers and usually run by a prime minister. Okay? So the authority of the executive comes from the parliament. The executive is not elected. Unlike in the US, as you know, where the president is elected or other presidential uh, systems or semi-presidential systems like in France. In a parliamentary system, the only elected body, if, it, if they have elections, is the parliament, the legislature, okay? The parliament. And that it's this elected authority that then gives the authority to the executive to perform the functions of implementing the law. Because remember, the legislature does what? Does what? Passes laws, uh, the executive implements laws, basically, right? And also formulates policy. That's the essence of parliamentary system. Right? And this is why uh, many constitutional monarchies are parliamentary systems, because in many constitutional monarchies, the monarch, like in Britain, is, sits, uh, sits not on top or above, <laughs> above, in a way above it, but not on top of it. Because the monarch is in the UK today, for example, which is a parliamentary system and a constitutional monarchy. The monarch in the UK, the queen, has only ceremonial symbolic roles. The queen represents the United Kingdom as such. Right? Uh, while the Prime Minister in the UK runs the country. Runs the country in as much as he has the support of the Parliament. Because it's after the election to the Parliament that a majority is formed and that majority sends people to populate the executive. That they can remove the executive. Power rests with the Parliament, which is why it's called a parliamentary system. And so it's elected. Parliament is elected, there's a majority. This one appoints an executive, usually from its own members, but it can withdraw that authority. So the Prime Minister is his head of executive, while the, the, the monarch is head of state. Right? Head of state. Now, parliamentary systems don't have to be monarchies. Germany is a parliamentary system and it has a president instead of a monarch. But the roles are the same. In Germany, it's the president who is simply just ceremonial, and the Prime Minister is head of executive. The point you need to understand is that in the par modern parliamentary system, the current parliamentary system, the machinery is made of, of government is made is based on the power of the parliament. People elect the parliament in today, right? And the parliament then appoints members of the executive, ministers, meaning the, you know the equivalent of secretaries uh, uh, of the different departments of the government of the cabinet in the US, right? And the head of the executive is a PM. And usually these people actually come from the parliament themselves, which can be called them as well. And the most the important person here and powerful in terms of making policy is the Prime Minister, the head of the executive, because he's in many ways also the head of the ruling party here. Monarch remains just ceremonial. Now, was the, uh, uh, how shall we, Austria Hungary, Austria Hungary Empire, I'm going to keep calling you that way because, again, it doesn't have a fixed name. They called it, let me just uh, mention here, the official name was the lands and kingdoms represented in the Reichsrat. So it's it's sort of a loose thing. So all the lands and kingdoms that are represented in the Reichsrat, and the Reichsrat was that common level of government that united all these entities. We're going to get back to this right? uh, in, in a second. Right? Uh, but it's basically whoever is represented in that common level of government is part of this entity. Which makes it so fascinating and so interesting because you see how it is an attempt to make due and to respect the different sovereignty of, of different uh, lands and their historical uh, rights, right? Um, in, I'm going to get back to that in a second. So, was the Austro-Hungarian uh, monarchy that? No. It wasn't because in this system, the monarch was not just a symbolic head. The monarch also had executive functions. So he was the head of the executive, one, in a way, and, and he appointed uh, members of the executive, both in Austria, uh, in this part, in Cisletania, and in Hungary, right? So, their existence 
So he appointed the members of the executive. So you're going to say, well, wait a minute, that makes it completely not parliamentary because they, are, they should be the ones who depend on the parliament. Yes, he appointed them, but their uh, composition need, need, needed also the majority in the parliament. So it was sort of a, you know, this connection existed. So, but it was in between the two. Furthermore, it was less of a parliamentary system in the sense that, uh, and you read that in the materials, the parliaments themselves were only partially elected. First of all, um, both parliaments in Austria and Hungary were bicameral, which meant that they have an upper house and the lower house. The upper house was appointed, and the lower house was elected. And, but it wasn't elected by the entire population, but only by a part of the population. Now this is again similar to what the UK has today, because UK also has two houses. The upper house is appointed, is not elected. It's appointed by the Queen, but actually by the Prime Minister. So it's appointed uh, while the lower, it's the House of Lords in the UK, while the lower house is directly elected. So the UK still has a similar uh, thing, right, in, in uh, the level of the parliament. So to, 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 clarify, to briefly describe it once again, both in Austria and in Hungary, so both Austria, or Cisleitania, right, and Hungary, I'm going to call it Austria, well, I'm going to call it Cisleitania still. But by that I mean the Austrian part, right? Uh, and Hungary had their own levels of government. Each of them was a quasi parliamentary system, quasi constitutional monarchy, because each of them had a bicameral parliament, a lower house and an upper house, of which the upper house was appointed and the lower house was elected. And each of them had an executive with a sort of a prime minister, it was called minister president, president of the council, it doesn't matter, you can call it prime minister because that's the function. The difference, however, was that both these, both of these executives were appointed by the emperor, who asked for the support of the, or based on the support that, that he had, or, or they had, in the parliament, okay. So the uh, uh, the emperor uh, chose people who had support of the majority in the parliament in each country. So this is what made it a dual monarchy because you have two states with two political systems, right? And again, what is a state? Is a set of institutions with sovereign power over you know territory membership. These are these are the sets of institutions: uh, a legislature and an executive. And what makes it one state and one entity is that there was, a, this was at the level of uh, Cisleitania or Austria, as you see, uh, and uh, this was at the level of Hungary, right? Each of them with their own government. But there were certain functions that were shared mean, uh, in the sense that 